The following program is shot in 4K high dynamic range and broadcast in high definition from Capital Broadcasting Company. The pandemic has certainly put a damper on the vibrancy that has lured so many people to Raleigh. Downtown is a ghost town. But with the vaccine rollout, hopes are that downtown will return to the place that helped make Raleigh the second fastest growing large metro in the nation. Just phenomenal growth that we've not experienced before. Particularly in and around downtown. Raleigh's downtown is in a growth spurt. You got large operations like Red Hat, Citrix, they've moved into the area, a lot of attorneys, professional people. And for good reasons. I think everybody knows that we are one of the top places to live and work. And play. Our music scene has just really exploded, more cultural things. But with growth come growing pains. Housing inventory is not quite keeping pace with growth. Inflating home prices. We've seen housing jumping 10% in the last year. Rent is jumping too. Wages really haven't kept pace at all with the cost of rental housing. And there is a shortage of affordable housing. As wealthier people move in, there's a concern among some about less affluent residents being forced out by rising rents and taxes. That's happening in some of the historically black neighborhoods in East and Southeast Raleigh. It's just been gentrified completely, wiped out. So what's the solution? There are a lot of people looking for answers, and I don't think anybody has found a good one. It's easy to see the transformation happening in cities like Charlotte, Durham, and Raleigh. Neighborhoods that have historically been home to low and middle income African American families are changing and changing fast. Deborah Ford lives in this home in East Raleigh's Longview neighborhood. I lived in East Raleigh for 25 years. Long enough to see dramatic change, new houses going up that are much larger than the older ones around them. Instead of looking like houses, they look like apartment buildings sitting on top of each other. They're much more expensive too. Starting at four to $500,000. That's having an impact on Ford and her neighbors. It's starting to hurt. I can tell you that. Ford says her monthly mortgage payment has gone up $100 because the escrow portion of it has gone up because her annual property taxes have gone up. Oh, it impacts me a lot. Because, see, I got to figure out what can I pay to still make myself be comfortable in my home. Ford says she doesn't mind most of the new people moving into East Raleigh, but there are exceptions. One thing that I have a problem with is people that come into the neighborhood that I've been in and you see me and you don't speak. You try your best not to even look my way. That's what I go through. Pam Keenan says she is not that kind of a neighbor. In August of 2019, she had this house built on a vacant lot in East Raleigh's Washington Heights neighborhood, about two miles from where Deborah Ford lives. Keenan says she has made an effort to get to know her neighbors. They seem to like me, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Keenan works in Raleigh and wanted to be close to its downtown. I lived in Cary when I was raising my son, but the rest of my adult life I've always lived in, in downtown somewhere. Keenan says the cookie cutter conformity of the suburbs just isn't for her. I just find that extremely boring. It's just kind of you're going through life on snooze. And her commute to work? It became 45, 50 minutes of just grinding day to day, stop and go. But there are other reasons she moved here. The main reason that I like living downtown is diversity, and that's not just racial diversity or ethnic diversity, it's economic diversity. That's the world we live in, that's the world I work in, and that's where I want to live as well. Keenan also loves being minutes from downtown. So it's nice that we have performing arts, and we have lectures, and we have music, and we have restaurants, and we have festivals, and parks, and things like that that I'll still want to be doing when I'm an old lady in red tennis shoes. But uh, it'll be easier to get to it and get home at night. 
And her commute to work now? 15 minutes, it's fabulous. This one is pre-sold, so the customer um, chose all the colors. Mike Papard's company, Grayson Homes, built Keenan's house. He's building a lot of homes near downtown Raleigh these days. It used to be people moved here from out of state and they'd move to the areas like Cary and Wake Forest, but today we find more people moving downtown for conveniences. But there is little vacant land near downtown to build on. We have customers that would prefer to just, you know, let's, let's take out the old home and let's boost, build something new. And so, it, you know, it's really increased our business quite a bit you know, over the last few years for sure. Yes, absolutely, we can do that. I'd love to see you this afternoon. Marshall Ridge has benefited from the growth to too. It's been mind-boggling. Rich specializes in selling homes near downtown. I think we've seen a shift overall from living in suburbia to a more downtown-centric kind of uh, way of living. Especially as Raleigh's downtown area has evolved with new high-rise condos, music venues, restaurants, and cultural attractions. And many people living in the downtown area enjoy being able to walk to those things. It's really a mini metro, and I think that's one of the things that's made it attractive. So have housing costs, which are far less than in big cities like San Francisco or New York. The average rent in Manhattan is $3,500 a month, while the average rent in Raleigh is $1,100 a month. You can see that it's a lot more affordable to live in Raleigh than it is in a lot of other larger metros. But Raleigh gives a small town feel, but with the city amenities. So far to being a good neighbor. That's, That's what Pam neighbor. Keenan likes about her Washington Heights neighborhood. It's just a nice neighborhood feeling over here, and yet you're a mile from the city center. It's a far cry from the Cary suburb she moved from. I'm in my 60s, and I live alone, and my mother was reading me all the crime statistics for this sector of, of Raleigh. But as someone who has lived in big city downtowns before, crime wasn't Keenan's biggest concern. I was really concerned about what the people here would think of me because I've come and built the big house on the corner. And then we've got three new houses next to mine. I kind of spurred that development. So we've come in kind of like the 800 pound gorilla into their neighborhood. And I was concerned what they would think about that. I made a, a real effort to, to get to know my neighbors, to be a part of the neighborhood, to be a good neighbor to them. I moved into their neighborhood by choice and, and don't want their neighborhood to change as a result of that. I just want to be a good neighbor to the people that are here. But not everyone has the same choices. Next, why people with deep ties to East and Southeast Raleigh say they can no longer choose to live here. The prices are just way too high. When Chalisa Williams drives through Southeast Raleigh, she barely recognizes the place she moved to in 2008. It's changed drastically. There's just more people on the streets now. The homes, the homes look different. Blame it on Raleigh's rapid growth. There's a real shortage of supply of homes. The builders can't keep up with the influx of people to this county because it takes them a year to permit and build a house. We have a shortage of housing across the board of all types, of all price ranges, uh, rental and home ownership units. So just that demand in and of itself is going to drive up prices. We have seen a steady um, <laughs> increase in housing prices. There's a lot of demand um, in Raleigh, especially um, if you look inside the Beltline. It's really hard for most people to afford um, a house from 2011 through 2019, the median price of a single-family detached home in Raleigh increased 22 percent. Median apartment rent rose 34 percent, compounding the problem. Wages really haven't kept pace at all with, you know, the cost of rental housing. Land prices are increasing too. In much of East and Southeast Raleigh, lots are worth more than the houses on them. People are buying homes just to tear them down. I've even heard stories about people receiving phone calls about selling their properties. And people coming and knocking on their door about selling their properties. There's a lot of older homes that 
it just don't seem to be worth it to fix up. They're kind of on their last leg, we say, and so people would rather just, you know, use the land for a better purpose, which is, you know, new home construction. Which helps drive up the value of surrounding homes. Williams has been renting an apartment near downtown for 12 years. She wants to buy her first home in southeast Raleigh. It was just home to me. The convenience, the people, the culture, the history. Housing is a choice. I believe that we should be able to choose where we live. But when Williams drives through the neighborhoods she would choose to live in, she can't afford the prices. Four, fifty, five hundred, six fifty. I'm talking about condos in the sixes, which is unheard of. Like we're not in New York. <laughs> like this isn't LA. <laughs> like this is Raleigh. This, this the stuff that we're experiencing. It's like major cities. The only thing that I could possibly say is gentrification. I don't know any other way to explain the development and the change in this community other than that. Meaning homeowners who can no longer afford their property taxes and tenants who can no longer afford their rent are moving out. People are being displaced. The reason East and Southeast Raleigh neighborhoods have largely been African American is because of city housing policies designed to keep them that way after the end of legal segregation decades ago. It was a practice called redlining. The gentrification happening here now is like a new form of redlining, only driven more by market forces than city ordinances. People like Pam Keenan, who will pay to live close to downtown, are driving them. She understands her new home may raise property values and thus property taxes on her neighbor's homes. There's some forces going on that, that are just inevitable, but I, my sense is that no matter what I do, those things are going to happen anyway. There's really nothing that you know, the city of Raleigh can do to control market forces. What we can attempt to do, though, is to mitigate some of the impacts of gentrification. An article about gentrification in the New York Times in 2019 focused on southeast Raleigh. It pains me, and at the same time, I'm like, okay, this is also exciting because we are growing, people do want to be here, but what are we going to do to be that example of how you manage this? Manage a problem that began with the city's own discriminatory housing policies from decades ago. And that's one reason why we are looking at changing zoning laws, looking at providing more housing choice, looking at providing more opportunity. Raleigh's $80 million affordable housing bond that voters passed in November will help. The money will support public-private partnerships for new developments, buy land to build affordable housing, rehabilitate older homes, provide financing to nonprofits and private developers to help cover the costs of building affordable housing, and provide money for first-time home buyers. The housing bond is a good start, but the fact is we can't buy our way out of this issue. The city is also looking at increasing housing density on lots where a home may be torn down. So maybe now we can house three families on that lot, on three nice cottage homes or three townhomes, whereas before with the zoning, we could only do one giant single family that made sense economically. A new zoning proposal here. That would help create more of the so-called missing middle when it comes to new housing inside the Beltline. That missing 1,700 to 2,300 square foot that's more affordable. More affordable for people like Chalisa Williams. Ironically, her salary working for a nonprofit that helps create affordable housing disqualifies her for that very thing. But it also helped her pre-qualify to buy something in the 300s. I'm looking for my first home, something that I can have as an asset, something that I can utilize and pass down for generations and generations. Something in Southeast Raleigh. My goal is to see me, <laughs> you know, down here, but I could doubt if it continues to go the way it's going now, I won't see anyone who looks like me. You know, I think we'll be completely wiped out and most of our history as well. Pam Keenan says she doesn't want to see that happen. She embraces the diversity of her neighborhood and her neighbors. You know, you just wonder, if this, is this going to be safe? Is this going to be friendly? Is this going to be neighborly? And I've found all those things to be true. I, I feel just fine living here. I have gotten to meet my neighbors and to spend some time with them. 
As soon as COVID's over, I, I intend to have a block party and just see how many other neighbors I can get to know. Williams appreciates that sentiment. She hopes most of the people moving into the area have Keenan's attitude, but she says her experience hasn't been quite the same. People are looking at me strange, and I'm like, this is my community, you know? Well, it, you don't have to be afraid of me, you know? I should be afraid of you all. You are coming up <laughs> and, and taking over our communities. Next, a woman affected by gentrification leads a project that is making a difference in Southeast Raleigh. I believe that we can make change and be inclusive of all people. And what will the pandemic mean for Raleigh's downtown and the housing boom people moving into the area helped create? I believe that they know intuitively that it will come back and that they're, they're willing to wait it out. To watch the WRL documentary Home Economics on demand anytime, go to WRLDocumentary.com and all of these streaming platforms. You can also join the conversation by following WRL Doc on Facebook and Twitter. And we are now crossing the line from Nightdale into Southeast Raleigh. When Kia Baker leaves her Nightdale home and heads to work, she drives through the Southeast Raleigh neighborhood where she grew up. After college, she wanted to buy a home here. She looked at one right across the street from her parents' house. It went on the market after the owner died. Some investors bought it for about $100,000, big corner lot. Um, and then the next thing I know, I looked up and it was on the market for about 425000 So those kind of things were definitely out of, out of reach. So she looked at other homes for sale in her price range. But we were outbid on all of those. So she bought this home that she could afford out in Nightdale. I still consider my community Southeast Raleigh, but I'm a Nightdale resident. For a lot of folks, the idea of not being able to afford to live in the place that you grew up in um, is, you know, heartbreaking um, and a hard pill to swallow. Certainly what's happening uh, in Southeast Raleigh and other areas of Raleigh is gentrification. Baker now leads a nonprofit organization trying to do something about it. It's called Southeast Raleigh Promise. It partnered with other nonprofits, the city, the public school system, and the YMCA to create a community in Southeast Raleigh called the Beacon Site. And the model says that if you combine high quality education from birth to college with mixed income housing and access to high quality health and wellness facilities, that you have the ability to change the trajectory of an entire neighborhood or community, not just the lives of the individuals, but the entire community. Um, and that's what we're going for. The idea is to help end the cycle of intergenerational poverty that has plagued many parts of Southeast Raleigh and allow people to stay here without being forced out by gentrification. It has its own YMCA, the new Southeast Raleigh Elementary School, playgrounds, a greenway, and more. It's also close to restaurants and shopping. And there is a 120-unit affordable housing community called Beacon Ridge. Shannon and Bonetta Ty moved here in November. When they relocated to the Triangle in 2017, they wanted to live in Southeast Raleigh. It's prime property. We're uh, proximity to a lot of local amenities. Easy access to downtown, easy access to the Beltline. Uh, we know the area is uh, up and coming, and we want to be part of that, uh, that, that growth there. They rented an older home here, but worried about becoming victims of gentrification. Houses being torn down, and then new ones just pop up in this place there. Hey, Mom, look at wow, what is it? When their rent started creeping up, they found a way out at Beacon Ridge. Is, the rent is cheaper, and the apartment is better. Everything was new. We knew things were going to work. Things actually were installed correctly. Things uh, weren't going to break on us. We have a dishwasher. <laughs> I, I, okay, I rinse and pack and rinse and pack, and then I have the washer and dryer, and I can just, it's convenient. And even more important than that. I wanted to live over here in Beacon Ridge for the community aspect of it. The Ties are members of the Y, and two of their four children are attending the elementary school. They can walk to both. Being in this neighborhood, we feel very safe. We feel um, very welcome. And they feel better about their future. 
I want to own a home one day. I want to have my own backyard. I want to have my own space. So living here allows us to be able to set a stronger foundation to get ourselves better prepared for the housing market, better prepared for possibly buying one day. Baker hopes the Beacon site is a model for how to help address gentrification in Raleigh and other cities in North Carolina. And so what we want to do is focus on revitalization in this work with a lens of racial equity to ensure that we are mitigating the negative impacts for the most vulnerable of our population. With so many people losing their jobs, the pandemic has only made the affordable housing shortage worse. So what impact will the pandemic have on the demand for housing around downtown Raleigh and the vibrant city center that helped create it? Downtown is a ghost town and people are upset about that. But the reason why it's a ghost town is because people are not coming to work. But the mayor believes workers will return when the pandemic is over. I've talked to people in our tech companies too who say, you know what, we miss the culture. You know, when you're with a group of people, that's when you can generate big ideas. That's when you can be innovative. But will people still want to live in the more densely populated downtown area? Some people are saying, oh, this is the end of density. I don't believe that. I, I think that that is probably the most environmentally conscious way we can grow. And also, it's a way to reduce um, traffic. Baldwin and others don't see a mass exodus of people moving out of downtown and back to the suburbs. I don't think it's going to be as significant across the board that, you know, you would take away from the vibrancy that, you know, that we have in downtown Raleigh now. People know that it's not going to be forever. Being in downtown Raleigh is not the same right now as being in downtown LA. We're going to continue to see a high demand for single family homes in downtown Raleigh and in the quasi urban neighborhoods that surround downtown Raleigh. I don't see a supply of those increasing anytime soon and I see demand continuing. Perhaps the pandemic has highlighted the need to handle that in a more responsible way. The pandemic kind of reinforced with everyone how fragile we all are or all could be. And I think, you know, just how important housing is to one's well-being and health and everything else.